Bueno, it's the ultimo baile, that last dance. That's not really how indigenous people connect with plants. But then the first one wasn't either. But I had an image of how I thought it would look and how that would connect to people's identity. And then I learned about reality. So how did I get interested in the environment and the connection with that and how that manifests within people? Well, it started when I was young. That one is me. I was pretty excited about nature. What's happening is it's snowing. And I'm from California. This was the first time it had snowed, and frankly, the last time. And I was all about it. Now, that's my friend Megan. And she's looking a little perplexed because she's wondering, why is it snowing in California when it's not supposed to? So I have since started to try and look a little more in depth at what's happening around me instead of just trying to eat it. So how do I do this? I do this through ethnobotany. And when I say I am an ethnobotanist, or you hago la ethnobotanica, people say, ah, oh, uh, okay. <laughs> what is that? So ethnobotany is the relationship between people and plants. And that can be medicinal plants, but it can also be much simpler. It can be simply peeling an orange. That's connecting to a plant. Then you have flowers. But these flowers have meaning. Meaning in a certain place in Mexico. Meaning in a certain time of year in the fall. And connecting to a specific tradition. That tradition is Day of the Dead. So when we look at Mexican identity wrapped up with a plant, we saw this throughout the flowers were strewn throughout the city. And then we look at a specific plant. If we're talking about identity, oh, that one, corn. Traditionally, worshipped by indigenous people. Today, worshipped by the world. So we really see that corn connects the world to Mexico. But there's also a very local connection. I was studying in Mexico, and the abuela de la casa, she would take the corn, and she would take two dry cobs, and she would rub them together, and the kernels would fall onto a sheet, and she would wrap up the sheet, pour it into the sacks, and then take them off to be made into tortillas. And if you look behind one of the sacks, <laughs> somebody is waiting. The abuela walked out of the house, and wah! So I call this modern day corn worship. <laughs> so the next time you are eating a tortilla, you can think of a saw, little sweaty muchacho jugando into maíz. <laughs> so what I'm really interested in, what is the indigenous connection to plants? And there are deep traditions. This can be with medicine, with ritual, or just the thatch on their roof. It's definitely part of their identity and that this is shifting. I had an image of what I thought indigenous people looked like and how they lived. And then I began to learn how they really look and how they really live. And that there's an evolving identity. So an example of this, I was working with a Lacando and a relative of the Yucatec Maya. And there was a little group of children playing. And I said, oh, you puedo tomar tu foto, está bien? And he goes, ah, sí, sí, sí. So I brought up the camera, and I'm about to take it. And they looked at each other, and they went, oh, and they all ran off. And I thought, oh, cultural faux pas, number 200, and I don't know what. What have I done? And then they came back, and they were each carrying a puppy. <laughs> and they all posed. I go, yeah, estamos listos. <laughs> OK. So I took the picture. But this image fit my image of what I thought an indigenous person looked like. They have their traditional robes. They have their long hair. But then these are also Lacandon. They were working with us to collect plants. So I was also getting the fluidity of culture. So I wanted to work with the rural Yucatec Maya, so I went out to do that. Or I thought that's what I was going out to do. I went out to an ejido in the Yucatan. 
And I arrived, and I hung out my hammock, and I was feeling very much like a, like a researcher. And I took my dirty clothes, and I went out to my, my little bucket, and I was washing my clothes. And then I felt this ping, ping. And I looked up, and there in a tree was a little boy with a little stone ready to throw the third one. And I looked up, and I said, hola. <laughs> And he came down out of the tree, and he circled around me, and he had this little man stance. He said, hola, soy Julio. <laughs> hola, soy Maria. And then he went around, and he looked into my pail with my clothes. And he said, you wash clothes pretty well for a gringa. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, I'm in, <laughs> all right. So our relationship actually very much changed from being the, the small child who threw stones at me and assessed my ability to wash clothes correctly to, uh, to my friend. And there'd be many mornings when I would wake up to pss, pss, gringa. A and I would wake up and I would, I'd look through my, my hammock netting and um, I hung my hammock very high. I thought that would protect me from whatever was going to jump up and bite me in the night. <laughs> um, but it also left room for a small child to stand right under it. <laughs> so pss, pss, gringa, uh, uh. Yeah, tienes que ir. Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. And so, so what was I doing? I was going out to count palm trees. And these were spiny palms. So there was nothing fun about this. You got stuck. You got bitten by mosquitoes. It was sweaty. I was like, oh, I'm a tough field worker. I was like, this is hard. Um, but I was studying Mayan plant weaving. And they, we'd been counting the palms, doing the ecological part. And now it was time to do the interviews. And uh, when I brought this up with the guy who took me out there, and he, he was much bigger than Julio, and he was kind of a, a macho guy, and he suddenly went, oh, um, yeah, well, we don't really have the weavers here anymore. So, oh. And he said, and these palms? I said, right, the ones where we get stuck and we get bitten by mosquitoes and we're all sweaty, uh -huh, these palms? He said, those exactly. He said, yeah, they never use those to weave. <laughs> mm -hmm. I said, well, isn't this where the weavers came and, and, and settled? He said, oh, yeah, yeah. They were here. They just, they've gone home. <laughs> they, they all went back to Bikal. And he said, well, everyone knew why I was here. Why didn't anyone tell me? I said, well, we didn't want you to leave. So I was like, oh. So I, um, so I, so I left. <laughs> so now I had to get to Bikal. But I didn't nobody in, know anyone in Bekal. But I've learned that Yucatan is a very connected place. So I had a Yucatec Maya teacher, Emma. And she said, oh my god, mother lives in Bekal. You can just go stay with her. And I said, great. You know, you, so you've been seeing her lately. This will be kind of a normal thing. She's like, oh, no, I haven't seen her in years. I said, aha, uh -huh, do, you, do you maybe want to call before you, you know, drop a gringa on her doorstep? <laughs> and she said, ah, no phone, don't worry. So uh, I worried. <laughs> so we go, we, we, we get a picnic together, and we show up, and oh, they're so excited to see each other because they haven't seen each other in years. And woohoo, and everybody's having a good time. No one says what I am doing there. And then right at the end when they're leaving, Emma kind of pushes me back, and then she says to her godmother, ah, it's okay if we leave her here with you. And the godmother looks at me. And she said, claro, bienvenida. And this is really how people have treated me throughout the Yucatan. So she takes me to the center of town and talk about a hat-weaving people and talk about identity. This is the center of town, these huge hats. This is what they are about. So what is the material? What is the plant? It's hippie, or also called the Panama hat palm. Now, it's an interesting name because it is not a palm, nor is it from Panama. So how did it get its name? Originally, it was woven in the town of Hippi, Hapa, in Ecuador. But there wasn't a lot of business in Ecuador. So they then brought them to Panama, where there was more traffic. And then when they built the canal, all the workers needed to have hats. Everyone going through the canal needed to have hats. So it became really well known. So it looks like a palm, and it became famous in Panama. So they call it the Panama hat palm. So how did it get to the Yucatan? How does it connect to the Maya? The Maya were originally weaving palm mats, 
with the local palm trees. Then the Spaniards came and encouraged them to weave them into hats. So they adapted their ability into hats. And then in the 1800s, someone came from Guatemala and they brought with them some of the hippie plant. And they saw this was far superior and they started weaving with that and they were making the hats and the hats became so similar to the ones that were made in Hippie Hapa that they themselves began to call these hats hippies or Panamas. So now they're famous from the Yucatan. You can get your thorough original Panama hat made in the Yucatan. So we're seeing this fluidity of identity. You had this traditional Mayan indigenous identity using the local palm, then you had European influence, then you had an introduced plant, you have a name from somewhere else, and now this is becoming an indigenous artisan identity. So how do you make them? You take the cogoyo, you take the unopened palm leaf, and what she's doing here is she's taking a needle and she's splitting each leaflet into smaller and smaller strands. The smaller the better. And ultra fino es lo mejor. Best one. What you can do is you roll it up and you can put it through a ring and then put it on your head and you're good to go. You would then cook the material, dry it, and then you start to weave it. But this is where there were some complications. The Yucatan is a dry area, so you'd start to get breakage in your material. So they worked not only with the land, but in the land. They did caves. You're closer to the water table, it's humid under there, and your material stays supple, and you can weave. And it also develops community. Almost everyone has one in their backyards, and families will get together, neighbors will come together, and they weave and sing deep into the night. So you have this connection with plants, which is now really also connecting people to each other. So where's the market? There are a few stores in Baikal. You see street vendors throughout Mexico. But where this local identity really becomes global is in Cancun. Here, you, it's international. The people who live here are international. Tourism is international. Global markets. So we're really seeing all of this is helping people connect to the land. You know, woohoo! But there's a problem, it's threatened. Many of the younger people, they don't want to learn how to weave. They want to work in tourism. They want to work in these global markets. So you do have a loss of identity. But you also have an expansion. I went back to the original Ejido to say goodbye, and Julio comes running out, Maria, ya tenemos un weaver! <laughs> All right! And what happened is one of the original inhabitants was still there, and kind of through its ingenuity, he was using this new palm, that spiny palm, this old tradition to create a new identity. And he's teaching others. So we're seeing a resiliency of tradition in the light of changing circumstances. Now, the incentive that has almost always been somewhat economic. And that brings us back to Cancun. This is going to be the biggest market. So we see with all the tourism and internationalism, so it's really supporting tradition and identity and people's connection to plants. So when we look at our relationship with the natural world, it connects all of us to ourselves and to all of our own evolving identities. Thank you. <laughs>